In April 1986, I was working in Moscow for the Reuters news agency. I'd been there about a year, and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, the Soviet Communist Party leader, had been in power for about the same period of time. And I had recently uh, become friends with a, a very pleasant, lively Scottish woman who worked for the British Council uh, in Kiev, the capital of Soviet Ukraine. And we agreed that I should go down there for a long weekend uh, to see Kiev, where I'd never been before, and spend some time with her. And uh, so I flew down on the afternoon of Friday, April the 23rd, and we met up and we spent the Friday night with a Ukrainian friend of hers. And we had a good time on the Saturday and Sunday. What we didn't know was that... Uh, 80 miles north of Kiev at the Chernobyl nuclear power station. For some reason, unknown to uh, the rest of the world, but and only to themselves, uh, safety uh, control staff at the nuclear power station were conducting uh, experiments with their systems, and they made some catastrophic mistake and huge amounts of power built up inside the fourth reactor and it exploded um, at 23 minutes past one in the morning on Saturday, the 26th of April. Now, in Kiev, my friend uh, Rona and I knew absolutely nothing about this, nor did anyone uh, in, in the city itself. There's about two and a half million people lived in Kiev. In fact, in the entire Soviet Union, probably only a handful of very high level Communist Party officials and scientists and doctors and firefighters who were who were brought to the nuclear power station to try and put out the the fire from the explosion only they knew and therefore what that meant was that on the saturday and sunday in kiev uh rona and i were walking around the city in the open air uh, quite oblivious to the fact that it was becoming contaminated with radiation Eventually, uh, I flew back to Moscow on Monday, the 28th, and I went to the Reuters office, which was uh, about a 15 minute walk from the Kremlin. And the first thing one of my colleagues there said was, do you know anything about a nuclear accident in Ukraine? To which, of course, I said, no, everything was entirely normal there. And my colleague said, well, it's just that the Swedish embassy has called us in the last half hour and said, we think there might have been a nuclear accident in Ukraine. So that got me worried, of course. Um, the truth of the story leaked out from Sweden and Finland on that Monday afternoon uh, because clouds of radiation were discovered that uh, had been crossing the Soviet border into Scandinavia. But officially, the Soviet media and government had absolutely nothing to say about this at all. It was a place uh, of deeply entrenched habits of secrecy. Uh, bad news was suppressed completely in those days. And what happened was finally uh, uh, around, I think it was nine o'clock or a little earlier in the evening on that Monday, uh, a very short news item appeared on the uh, official news agency TASS, uh, which stated that there had indeed been a nuclear accident in Kiev, uh, but it didn't even say when it had happened or how, or how many people might have been killed or injured, and what was being done to clean it up, if anything. So really, it left more questions unanswered uh, than uh, had been uh, a mystery to us all in the first place. What the official news agency test did do, though, immediately after putting out this uh, mysterious little report, was put out a second report, uh, which said in the United States in 1979, there were 2,300 nuclear accidents. And this was the way the Soviet propaganda machine worked in those days, you see. They, they would try and blunt the, the most important message that there'd actually been something serious going wrong in the Soviet Union with... Uh, something that, that was so uh, 
enormous in its in its allegations um, from a propaganda point of view that it would drown what was the really important thing going on. Anyway, uh, it was pretty obvious to me uh, that night and the following morning that I should have myself checked uh, to see if I'd suffered radiation poisoning. So I called a, a friend at the British Embassy, first of all, uh, who in their inevitable way said, well, we're thinking of maybe bringing in some radiation monitoring equipment next week. I thought, well, next week that isn't going to be good enough. So I then called a, a friend I had at the American Embassy who I would talked to before about uh, Soviet science and their space exploration program. And he was a he was a very good guy. And when I told him that I'd been in Kiev during this uh, accident over the weekend, he said, listen, just 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 stay on the phone. I'm going to put you in touch with and he used this phrase, one of our guys. So who that was, I I don't know. But he appeared on the phone and said, OK, Mr. Barber, we're sending a car to collect you. Bring all the clothes that you were wearing in Kiev. So I ran out of the office. I got my clothes and waited uh, at the bottom entrance of the, my building. Sure enough, this US embassy car showed up. I was driven to the embassy and taken to a a quarter of it that I'd never seen before. It was a pretty big building. Um, and we used to go there sometimes to have a beer or, or they used to have discos every now and then, but I'd never been to this part of it. And what should I see but a, but a large Geiger counter? So it was obvious that for some reason, um, the American embassy had been monitoring radiation levels in Moscow for some time because they hadn't had time to fly this piece of equipment in. So I was asked to uh, strip and they put the Geiger counter on my body. They didn't discover anything except normal background levels of radiation. But when they put the machine over the clothes I'd worn in Kiev, it got to a pair of jeans I'd worn and this machine went beep, 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 beep. And I almost jumped out of my skin or fainted. I, I thought, this is it, you know, I'm done for. And uh, the uh, embassy official who was conducting the uh, test looked at me and said, OK, Mr. Barber, we're going to burn those jeans for you. And sure enough, he picked them up with a large pair of tongs or something and just put them in an incinerator <laughs> and burnt my jeans. So uh, they said, you're OK, you know, that's where the radiation was. Now we've got to figure out how the radiation got onto your genes. And we, we, we concluded what had happened was that on the Sunday evening in Kiev, this would have been about uh, 40 hours or so, I guess, after the accident. Uh, my friend Rona and I had, we'd, we'd gone to a, a hotel to the, the hard, what was called the hard currency part of the hotel, where you could buy slightly nicer things for dollars or West German marks. And we'd had a few drinks there. And then we'd, we'd gone back out into the open air and uh, wait, waited to get a tram to Kiev University where she lived. Uh, and we'd sat down on a bench at the tram stop. And that bench had accumulated radiation particles from the wind blowing the radiation from Kiev. And that was how sitting down in a pair of jeans on the tram bench stop, that's where, that's where the uh, radiation came from. So uh, back in Moscow, um, I was suffering all sorts of uh, uh, witty and uh, humiliating things. My colleagues said, oh, so you experienced the Big Bang in the Ukraine and you, did you glow in the dark and things like this, which, which must have been hilarious for, for those who weren't there, of course. So I emerged unscathed from the Chernobyl accident, uh, but uh, its importance in the longer term uh, for the Soviet Union was that this was the moment when Mikhail Gorbachev was able to break this this granite wall of secrecy around everything that the Communist Party and government did um, in in the country. And uh, once he had been able to uh, uh, use the accident as a way of saying we've got to tell our public more, we've got to we've got to have more open debate about things. And this is what he called glassness or the Russian word for openness. Uh, well, the floodgates opened and 
and it just got uh, more and more out of the control of the Communist Party in Moscow. And as we know, uh, less than six years later, um, the Soviet Union itself simply disintegrated. And uh, it, it all really, as Gorbachev himself says in his memoirs, it all really started with the nuclear accident uh, in Chernobyl. So I feel that I was on the front line of a uh, piece of history there.